Hello. Thank you for making the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. One evening, a dad was putting his little girl to bed, and she asked for a bedtime story. And so, as he tucked her in, he crafted this beautiful story about a princess and a young knight and a terrible dragon. The little girl was enamored. When the story was over, he kissed her goodnight and turned off the light. The next day, though, the little girl remembered the story, and she was telling her friends on the playground the story. And when she got to the end, she said, Do you know what happened next? And one of her friends said, Well, yeah, they live happily ever after. And the little girl looked at them confused, and she said, Well, no, they got married. As we begin today, I don't want to shock you, but... I kind of need to state the obvious. Every relationship, whether it's your family, friendships, businesses, even a church, every relationship experiences some kind of conflict. Disagreements and arguments are inevitable in a world where every individual is unique. We look at the world differently. We are not carbon copies of each other. My needs, my ideas, my vocabulary, my interest, my style, well, they're not the same as yours. And the longer and the deeper that we communicate, the closer that we get with each other, the more those differences show up and the more opportunity we have to experience conflict. As we start the second chapter of this beautiful letter of Philippians, Paul wants to touch on the question, how do we find unity in a world where Conflict seems to be the norm. In his book, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer gives this beautiful illustration. He says, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They're not of one accord by being tuned to each other, but to another standard which each one must individually bow. I believe that Tozer learned a thing or two from the Apostle Paul. If we want to have a successful church, a successful business, family, or friendships, we must all work together to be in tune with God. And this is the general consensus. We've got to figure out how to agree with one another. Yet the problem is, when I look back at the things that I said or wrote 10 years ago, I don't necessarily agree with all of those things now. I don't agree with myself, but God is unchanging. And if we can both agree with God, then we'll be able to find harmony with one another. So look with me at our text from chapter 2, and let's see what we can learn from Paul on how we can find the unity that we were created to enjoy. Paul writes, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Paul says that Our encouragement in this life comes from being united in four different ways. Paul says if we're going to find unity, we have to have the same mind, we have to have the same love, we have to be in one spirit, and we have to have one mind. But can I just be honest here and say that when I read this passage, I begin to wonder if it's one of those things that sound really good, but is it actually feasible? It's kind of like when Jesus says to go and sin no more. That's a great principle. I've just noticed in my life it's not very practical. And while it might not be easy, I believe what Paul's calling us to is possible. We just have to understand that this is not a passage written for someone else. I know there are times that I preach sermons and people say, Oh man, it would have been great if so-and-so would have been here. The truth is that this is a passage that you, that I need to hear. We need to apply this passage to our lives. We need to apply this passage to every single relationship that we're involved in. 
Paul's laying the burden for unity at your feet by outlining some things that we need to work on so that we can be in tune with God, and that's how we find unity with one another. The first thing that Paul teaches is that we must not be selfish. Now, maybe you're like me, and you don't think you have a big problem with selfishness. Maybe you could recite a long list and a long uh, list of ways that you give to other people. But before we get too comfortable and dismiss Paul's point, maybe we ought to consider a few questions. Okay, so you're getting out of the parking lot in Walmart and you find a $20 bill on the ground. So you reach down, you pick the $20 up and you put it in your pocket. But as you make it to the store, you see someone sitting off to the side and it's evident that they're down on their luck. They might even ask you if you have something that you can share with them. What do you do with that $20 bill? Let's say you walk into McDonald's. And when you get into McDonald's, you see there's this long line of people and there's only one person working at the cash register. Do you wait in line? Do you sigh and roll your eyes and make comments like, boy, they should hire more help? Or do you just leave and go to Burger King? You get done with your drink. And you have an empty glass. What do you do with that empty glass? Do you leave it on the table? Do you go and put it in the sink? Or do you put it in the dishwasher? When you're at the park and you're walking around and you see some trash lying on the ground, do you step over the trash? Do you reach down and pick the garbage up and go and take it and put it in the trash can? Somebody decides they're going to take a group picture. And when you look at the picture on the phone, you notice that your eyes are closed. Do you ask if you can take another picture? How well did you do? Whether or not we're comfortable admitting it, we all live in a very self-focused society. When we have to make a decision, every one of us asks, well, what's in it for me? How do I benefit from this? How does this make me look good? How does this make me feel better about myself? Paul reminds us, our question should not be, how does this benefit me? Rather, we need to ask the question, how is this going to benefit the kingdom of God? If you would allow me, I'd like to co-op a line from John F. Kennedy. Ask not what God can do for you, but ask what can you do for God and His kingdom. I think we need to spend less time thinking of what God and what the church can offer me, and we need to spend more time thinking about what can I offer God and what can I do for Him and His kingdom. It's all too easy to claim that I've placed my faith in Christ only to get over-focused on myself and to forget that the kingdom is about the body. Paul would later write to the church in Ephesus that we are all one body. The church isn't made up of a lot of disconnected people. The church is not you over there doing your thing and someone else over there doing their thing and me over here doing my thing. You know, there's a big difference between a pile of bricks in a wall. The pile of bricks are scattered all over the place. They might be together, but there's no strength in that pile of bricks because they're not connected to one another. But if we were to take a little cement, a little mortar, and we were to take those bricks and attach them together and to build a wall, well, that wall can withstand the harsh winds of life. We're being called to live a life that's connected to one another like a wall, but far too many of us are content just being a pile of bricks. I'm sure that we would say that we want to fulfill God's purposes, but sometimes we get selfish and we overfocus on my wants, my needs, my desires, my rights, because in the church there's all of this dysfunction. And the the body of Christ was created to work together to accomplish God's purpose. Sometimes I need a gentle reminder that all of life is about the kingdom of God, and other times I need a large flashing sign reminding me that I need to humble myself because God is God, and I have the privilege of serving Him in His kingdom. 
Paul urges us to use the example of Christ. In verse 5, he says, Christ did not demand and cling to his rights as God. And I think sometimes I'm over-worried about my rights, and I forget that Jesus also had certain rights as God, yet he selflessly gave up his own rights. Because if he demanded his rights, if he demanded what was best for him, God's plan would have never been fulfilled. So Jesus comes and spends his whole life denying himself, humbling himself for my well-being, for our well-being, for the benefit of others. Jesus willingly gave up everything that was rightfully his. The measure of a life well spent is not the great things that you've accomplished or how much success you've had. The true measure of a person's greatness is in their ability to humble themselves in the sight of God. In verse 3, Paul says that we don't live our lives just to impress other people. Each and every one of us have this inherent desire to be impressive. We want people to notice us, to respect us, to admire us, to admire our accomplishments. We want people to be impressed with who we are and what we do. We discussed here a few weeks ago that each one of us struggle with the sin of pride. We're, we're overly concerned about what other people think of us. We make decisions based solely on the optics. We, we worry about how people perceive what we've done or what people say about us. Just because you're a child of God doesn't mean you're immune. Sometimes we do acts of ministry just so that other people will see us. Sometimes we talk about what we've accomplished in the kingdom just so that you will know what we have done in the kingdom. We want other people to know what we've given, what we've sacrificed. Jesus didn't live his life to impress others. Paul said he made himself nothing. The King James Version I grew up with said, but he made himself no reputation. As the creator of the world, Jesus was deserving of all of the glory, and yet he voluntarily just set it aside. Jesus often talked about spiritual pride, especially with the Pharisees. In the eyes of the average Jew, the Pharisees were good men. They kept the law. They were model citizens. They very carefully observed all of the necessary religious rituals. By all outside appearances, the Pharisee lived a life that was decent and in order. Jesus saw it differently. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to point out that the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee was all show and no substance. Because they didn't do it from the heart. They didn't do it to please God. They did it for their own glory, their own attention. The danger with being worried about making a good impression is that you might do the good thing, but it really has no value in the kingdom because it's done with the wrong attitude. Sometimes we forget God's not as interested in our results as He is in our hearts. When we, we live our whole lives trying to impress others, we're actually trying to elevate ourselves because we want people to think more about us than they think about the, their own selves. In verse 3, Paul says that we must consider other people better than ourselves. And I'm just going to go ahead and admit that this gives us, me, a lot of trouble. I mean, I'm willing to work on humbling myself. I understand that God is greater than I am, that I needed Jesus to come and to offer me the salvation that I couldn't work out on my own. Humbling myself before God is one thing. But considering other people better than myself, does that mean everybody else? Or just the people that seem to have it all together? Too many of us have bought into this idea that our purpose is to please people and serve God. Paul is calling us to please God by serving people. We please God by the way that we serve others. Which means that we will never see someone that we're not supposed to serve in some way. We'll never meet someone that we're not supposed to love. We'll never see someone that we're not supposed to encourage. I think sometimes the depth of my service is just simply to see someone and to acknowledge that they are created in the image of God with a greeting and with a smile. I think sometimes the depth of my service is to actually listen to someone 
to listen to the care and to the concerns and to acknowledge they're created in the image of God. And sometimes the depth of my service is to come alongside someone created in the image of God in the middle of their pain and their struggle and their heartache so they don't have to walk alone. Considering other people better than myself is a reminder that I'm not here for me. We were not created to live by ourselves and for ourselves. God put us here. He put us in this place and at this time so that we could serve and love one another. It's impossible to be in conflict with other people that I consider more than myself. I might not agree with you, but I'm not going to be in conflict with you. I might believe there's a better way to do something, but my desire to love you is greater than my need to be right. Instead of us constantly having this apostolic fight about who's the greatest in the kingdom, Paul's calling us to take a seat in the back of the room, to go sit at the end of the table and celebrate what God is accomplishing, what God is doing in the lives of other people. Paul's not calling us to merely acknowledge the people that are created in the image of God. He's calling us to celebrate what God is doing in their lives, which is another way that we can avoid conflict. Paul says that we have to be invested in others. There's this teaching that's pretty prominent out there that the work of the kingdom should be done by the professionals, that there's a clergy class and a common class, that the clergy serves the people and the people are indebted to the clergy. One of the things that I love so much about our fellowship is that it was founded on this idea that the church belongs to the people. That the people have the right and the responsibility to be invested in the work of the kingdom. This church family will thrive or wither based on the investment of the members. I mean, I understand that I have a responsibility to this church family. I understand that we have shepherds, that we have deacons that have a responsibility to this church family. But in the kingdom of God... Every single one of us have our own role and function. We're called to invest in one another. All throughout Paul's letters, he encourages the Christians to love one another, to serve one another, bless one another, uplift one another, encourage one another, support one another, forgive one another, hold one another accountable. And those things can only happen when we are invested in one another. The church is about the people. We are the object of God's affection, and we must make sure that we never forget that we are being called to serve. Ministry is a lifelong act that must be done joyfully, willingly, and happily. Ministry is a humble act given gladly, without reservation, Service that comes from a heart of love and a place of thankfulness for what Christ has already done for us. If we were to actually have the mind of Christ, we would consider it a privilege to serve God, to serve the people that are in God's kingdom. After all, we can only serve one another because Christ served us first. He wasn't content to merely give his life for us. It wasn't easy. But because he was loved, because he loved us, he willingly gave his life for us. We have the opportunity to go to the table and to remember the great sacrifice of our humble Savior. We have the chance to take the bread and the cup and to be called into a life that emulates, that imitates our Savior. The table is an act that allows us to be invested in one another. As we sit across from one another, we're given the opportunity to share life, to talk about our successes and our struggles. It's at the table that we find the place that we can pray for one another and support one another in a way that rarely happens in a larger setting. So today you're being invited to the table to take the emblems, to focus on our humble Savior, and to focus on the fact that we are being called to serve one another, to serve the kingdom, and to make sure that we elevate God to his rightful place. 
We serve a Savior that loved us and cared for us and invites us to be disciples of His, to walk in the manner that He walked. And so it's my hope and my prayer that as you go to the table this morning and as you take these emblems, you think about what does it mean to be fully invested in the kingdom of God so that we can be attuned to God, to God's will, to God's desire, and to God's love and discover that in that moment, not only are we in unity with the Father, we're also in unity with one another. Have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you very soon. Never forget how deeply you're loved.